So I'm going to give a talk. It's titled here, What Drives Spinal Fusion Cells or Growth Factors? These are my disclosures. So historically, it was, uh, this is the way that orthobiologics were, were described and how you would make your choice. There were really just three options. We talked about the three O's, osteoconductive, osteoinductive, osteogenic. And iliac crest was said to be right here in the middle. It was a rather simple paradigm. Where we are today, it's gotten a lot more complicated. Right? There are now a bunch of additional terms uh, that, are, that are used out there to describe these, these bone graft products, angiogenic, bioactive, osteostimulatory, attract, attach, activate. And the, the big question mark really means, you know, uh, we need to question these. Uh, what really do these mean? So let's focus a little bit on each of them and starting first with osteoinduction. So osteoinduction really has been proven by Marshall Uris back in the 60s who first found you could demineralize bone which would then uh, create um, a new bone when implanted in a muscle defect. That then took several decades but ultimately led to the discovery and launch of recombinant BMPs, including BMP2 and BMP7. So to give you an idea of osteoinduction, and I, I've titled this one, The Proof is in the Muscle. This is what it looks like when you take a DBM, implant it into a muscle pouch of a rat for 28 days. You see robust bone formation. DBM is demineralized, so its radiographic profile at time zero is essentially nothing. You can't see it, so what you're seeing here is real bone. You take that exact same DBM, strip out the growth factors, and this is what it looks like in the same model. So now we're not seeing any bone formation. So what did we do here? We tested the product kind of isolating the elements. We isolated the BMP proteins in this DBM. We test it with the proteins, without the proteins, and we see a marked difference in performance, right? So this is really indisputable proof that osteoinduction is real. So as we go back to our chart, osteoconductive, we know that this is a, a true effect as well. We know that there are critical size defects that won't heal by themselves, but we put in a simple scaffold and now they will heal. So we know that to be true. But we have to look at all these other uh, uh, modalities and, and really question whether they are real, whether they have been proven. So I'm going to focus on osteogenic. Now, the class of materials that's really um, describing this osteogenic um, uh, profile more than others are cellular bone matrices, or CBMs. And there's a significant cost that's associated with adding the viable cell component. This is probably the fastest growing market now in the orthobiologic space. It's at least as big as DBMs, if not now, larger and, and sig significantly more expensive. You can see how many products uh, have been launched on the market. A few of these have now since been taken off the market. So there are a couple questions you may be thinking when it comes to these cellular bone matrices. And the first questions, question is, are the cells really alive? So there's a really nice paper published back in 2013 out of City of Hope that described this very well and really definitively proved that, yes, you can take these cellular bone matrices that have been cryopreserved, thaw them out, and those cells are alive. This was uh, using osteocell. They showed about 100,000 cells per cc and viability of about 90%. So there's strong evidence that, yes, the cells are alive. We've done some of our own internal testing, looking at a couple other products as well, this time osteocell Pro and Vivigen, and confirmed this as well. The cells really are alive. So question one, are the cells alive? The answer is yes, but is that really the right question? So question two, the right question, do the cells do anything? So we set out to, to conduct a study here to find out, do cells improve bone healing in spine? And our goal, like I described with the DBM osteoinduction, was to isolate the effect of the cellular component, component by testing the cellular bone matrices both with and without the cell component. It's a very simple test. Since there's such a high cost uh, associated with the cell fraction, and if that cell fraction is effective, the product should work better with the cells than without the cells. So our study design, we, we take two market-leading cellular bone matrix products, OsteoCell Pro, Vivigen, Formable, um, and test them in, their, in a dead state and then in their live state. The way that we actually kill the cells is using lyophilization. 
a simple freeze thaw process that we do on standard DBMs um, in, in regular production. The difference between these two materials, other than being from different tissue banks, so they may have different um, sources of bone and different ways to process them, but they also have different DBM substrates with them. Osteocell Pro has a DBM particulate, Vivagen Formable has a DBM fiber. And then we compared it to just a plain DBM uh, fiber product uh, from C-Spine. So first we have to find a scientifically valid model to use. And the, the model that's available to us is the athymic rat posterior lateral fusion model. Because they're athymic, that means they have a significantly impaired immune system, so you can implant human cells and growth factors into, a mod, into a, an animal without having a rejection. It's been widely published. If you look at PubMed, you see 700 uh, plus results for rat spinal fusion. And importantly, multiple uh, papers show the ability to take a controlled population of cells, implant them into these rats, and get a fusion perhaps improve uh, a fusion outcome, um, and also you see persistent engraftment. So it's a good model to use uh, for these sorts of materials. Our study was conducted in collaboration uh, with, uh, with USC. It was the athymic rat model at six weeks, which is a standard time point, 0.3 cc's per side, which is a standard time point. And we're looking at fusion based on micro CT where we grade each side independently of each other. So you, this, you see the sample size in each group, nine rats, but since we look at the fusion left and right separately, we have a sample size of 18 for the fusions. So first things first, we have to confirm again that these cells are alive. Before we implant these materials into the rats, we wanna uh, confirm that they're actually, they've been handled properly. So we do that using a tripan blue assay, which is a dye exclusion assay, um, which essentially means uh, live cells won't pick up the dye, but dead cells will. You can see our data on the right-hand side there. Osteocell showing around about 100,000 cells per cc when it's in its live state. Vivagen showing about 40,000 cells per cc. These pretty well uh, agree with uh, published and marketed literature for those two products. And you can see that our lyophilization step was very effective in killing off those cells um, as well. So this is our micro CT fusion grading scale. We have a, a four point scale. Zero means lack of bridging. Um, and with this particular example, I'm gonna show you. You can see here, no bone, really no bone uh, in the middle of this sample um, uh, that, I've, that I've drawn in the middle there. Number one means some bone formation in the middle, but without a mature cortex or any evidence of cortex. So we do see some bone in the middle, but I'm not seeing cortex. Number two, an incomplete cortex. So there's some cortex formation here. And then number three, complete cortex formation all the way around, extensive trabecular remodeling. So that's the most mature um, fusion um, that we can see. So jumping right to the results now, and here we're defining fusion as uh, a two or three on that scale, so evidence of complete bridging with at least discontinuous um, cortex formation. So Osteocell Pro, when tested in its dead state, uh, did not obtain fusion zero out of 18. In the live state, also did not obtain fusion zero out of 18. Vivagen formable, the DBM fiber with cells, performed a little bit better. In the dead state, about 61% fusion and in the live state, 61% fusion. So with both of these uh, cellular bone matrix materials, we did not see an increase when we isolated the effect of the cellular component. So no increase in fusion when the cells were alive versus when they uh, were dead. Then with our DBM fiber product, which is a high performing DBM product, we're able to get 17 out of 18 uh, fusion. So a higher fusion rate um, with just a DBM that does not contain any cells. These are some uh, representative radiographic images. So you see with the osteocell, um, the gap through the metal, non-convincing uh, fusions in any of those uh, samples. Vivagen tended to perform a little bit better than osteocell, uh, tended to have bone formation through the middle, occasionally with some cortex formation. And then osteostram plus, you see a really complete uh, mature fusion. 
as we, we like to do, just so you know that we're not cherry picking any of the images, I'm gonna show you every single image from every animal. So this is all the Osteocell Pro um, in the dead arm. You can see they all look exactly the same, very consistent. This is all the ones in the live group, almost a mirror image to each other and the slide I just showed. This is Vivagen Formable, again, performing better than the Osteocell group, but pretty consistent with itself again. You see, you see some good fusions and then some, some less impressive ones. And Vivagen Formable in the live group, again, very similar to before. Now, if we take a DBM fiber that's been specifically designed for this purpose, you can see a demonstrable difference between them. So the difference in the fusion, to me at least, is very obvious, and I hope it is uh, to you as well. So the conclusions that we, we, we get from this study, uh, no detectable benefit attributed to the viable cellular component, which really means if these cell-based products are made of a DBM substrate and then a cellular population on top of it, usually with uh, cancellous bone, but potentially with cortical bone um, as well. If that corticocancellous bone with the cells actually doesn't contribute to the fusion, then what you're left with behind is um, a diluted DBM product. So it's a very expensive diluted DBM product. Um, so why not create a DBM that really just looks to optimize the DBM portion itself without putting in the stuff that actually isn't contributing to the fusion? And that's what we saw in the study. So we're not the only ones. Um, we are the first who will publish uh, isolating the, the effect of the cell uh, within these cellular bone matrix studies um, uh, materials. However, we're not the only one to have published um, lackluster results for these cell-based products in rats. So here we have four different studies that have been published, and you can see highlighted in red, it's quite common for these cell-based materials not to perform well in a rat spinal fusion that is frankly very easy for us to fuse with a DBM material. But more than rats, uh, there's also a lack of convincing evidence in humans too. Uh, this is a very nice review paper that, that um, came out earlier this year and essentially concluded that while there are now a series of studies uh, showing cell-based products, uh, the strength of the evidence to support them is, is still very weak. These are all the papers that were cited in that review article. You can see there are about 11, almost all of them non-controlled. So my, on, on the right-hand side, we can see study one and study two are our controlled studies. The first for a product called MAP3. My understanding is that that product has been removed from the market at this point. And then the second one is a controlled, controlled study between Osteocell Plus, uh, which was compared to uh, VG2, structural allograft cage. I'll go through a couple of these in a little bit of detail. So this first comparative study uh, out of Mount Sinai, 114 subjects. It used a uh, uh, control arm of uh, structural allograft. One of the limitations of the study is that the test arm and the control arm were actually performed in different institutions, but they were matched uh, one and two level ACDFs, CT fusion at six and 12 months, and the results were about 88% for osteocell, 95% uh, for the structural allograft cage. Wasn't statistically different, but certainly um, a worrying trend. A few more studies. Uh, uh, this is the largest study uh, that has been published, 182 patients. This one was also osteocell plus in one and two level ACDF. They used CT at 6, 12, or 24 months, also flexion extension. You can see the results are very similar to the McEnany paper I just uh, mentioned previously. So about 87% one and two level or 92% one level only. If you dig into the data a little bit closer, you can see the 24 month results down here for all that was actually only about 82%. So if you looked at 24 months by itself, it was only actually 82% fused. A few other studies that I'll, I'll move through a little bit quickly. Another two level ACDF study showing reasonable uh, fusion rates at about 90, 90 to 90 plus percent. 
a lumbar posterior lateral fusion study, this time with Trinity, 43 subjects, um, uh, X-ray fusion at 12 months with also flexion extension, um, again showing uh, reasonable fusion rates of around about 90% in these patients. But what is interesting is if you uh, look up clinicaltrials.gov, you can um, review all of the studies that have been uh, planned um, and enrolled in. And we've pulled up a few of those here to show those that have been completed. So you can see various studies for Osteocell, various studies for Trinity, Celentra, PureGen, Vivagen, et cetera. Um, that have been completed or terminated, uh, but not many of these have been published. So with the osteocell arm, we see the ESLAC paper, there's 182 patients, was one of the papers that I highlighted, but there are various other studies that have, have not been published yet. Um, with the Trinity group, we do see some, some publications, and um, I'm not able to uh, correlate them directly because the number of patients don't line up, but we had 200 patients enrolled I'm over here now, in this ACDF study and a couple papers that were published but only adding up to about 71 patients out of the 200. And then similarly down here, 207 patients, uh, but our paper only showing about 43 subjects. Um, the PureGen studies down here were terminated because that product is off the market. I think Vivagen, the product down below, um, was just terminated because of uh, some practical issues. I think a surgeon left the practice. I don't read too much into that one. So the hard conclusions on cellular bone matrices, it's not all bad news. There are some studies out there know that now that do show uh, reasonable fusion results. However, there is still a lack of compelling data, in particular to substantiate that premium pricing. So when there is a lack of clinical data, can we at least prove a benefit in animals? We showed you our athymic rat study where we were, at, we were unable to show a benefit to the cell fraction where we tried to control the study as best as we can to isolate the elements. So if there's no benefit to the cell fraction and efficacy is, is really driven by the DBM, we also saw that some DBMs work better than others. Remember my last talk here, right? Uh, DBMs are not all the same. So this was me. I apparently had a beard um, at the time. Uh, but I gave this, this presentation. I was also happy to know that I got three thumbs up which is great. I'm looking for at least four from this talk, so hopefully you can all help me out on that one. Uh, but I, sh I uh, yeah, I don't know how many of those were just me re looking at it again, but um, we're going to do better this time. So I showed this slide, and it's really about DBMs and, and, and this iceberg analogy, right? A small portion of it is what you see above the surface. It's the handling characteristics and so on. But there's a lot that goes on underneath the surface that allows us to make either a really good DBM, a mediocre DBM, or a DBM that frankly doesn't work at all. So to get to that point a little bit, um, we've done a lot of other rat studies as well, looking at a lot of different DBM products. Some of these are 100% DBM. Some of these are DBM fiber-based products. Some of these are DBM particle-based products. But this is what they look like when you put them in the rat model, this time at four weeks at time zero. So again, you can't see the DBM at time zero. This is what they look like after four weeks. So you see a robust um, healing effect, or at least you you should see a robust healing effect, but you see big differences between all of these different materials, from rock solid fusions um, with some to very mediocre fusions with uh, some of the other materials. When we look at micro CT and grade these for fusion, again, it shows a similar story to what you, you just saw graphically on the slide before. Some of these DBMs work very well, giving you 100% fusion in the RAP model. Some will go as low as 0% fusion. Um, so again, not all DBMs um, are created equally. So my final takeaways, I just have three. Number one, be skeptical of unproven bone forming mechanisms. Demand osteoinduction. We know it's, it's true and we know it works. Two, we tested cellular bone matrices with and without the cells and observed no benefit to the cells in our rat model. And three, choose your DBM carefully. They're not all the same. And with that, I'll hand it over to, the, to you guys for any questions you may have.
So great talk. Uh, really, I, I think um, uh, the uh, the amount of investment that's going into this with very little data, you know, I think is it's one of the blind alleys that I think spine surgery has run into in recent years. I think, you know, the, there are comparable stories, uh, unfortunately, but I think this is, is going to prove to be one of them. And I think uh, I think your data goes a long ways to uh, starting to debunk some of this. Um, uh, can you give us what what are the cost differentials and not with actual dollars, but as a percent, how much more expensive are the cell based products typically than uh, the DBMs? At least two to three times more expensive. Yeah. So if a standard DBM for a 10 cc, maybe somewhere from one to two thousand dollars, and a cell based product might be thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah. 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 And uh, can you also elaborate what what are uh, some of the features that um, or techniques ra rather that you use to enhance the effectiveness of uh, a DBM? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, DBM, when we describe it, we describe it very simply. Cortical bone by itself, we know, is not inductive. Um, but it's made up of um, a mineral component, a collagen component, and then all the non-collagenous proteins, which include the BMPs. So when we want to demineralize it, we're essentially removing the hydroxyapatite. We take that cortical bone, we put it in hydrochloric acid, the hydroxyapatite goes away. What's left behind now is collagen and the growth factors. Um, now it's inductive because the growth factors are able to um, essentially come out into the body. Um, but as we describe it, it's very simple. Take the bone, dunk it in acid. Um, but it's actually not quite that simple. Uh, and it turns out that demineralizing bone, um, um, you can not demineralize enough, and it never becomes inductive. But if you demineralize too far, uh, then it becomes less inductive again. So there's kind of a sweet spot in your demineralization cycle. So we put in a lot of controls about how we actually do that. Analogy I like to use is that it's kind of like cooking a steak. Right? You know that you can go to the best steakhouse in town and, and have one of the best meals you've ever had in your life, or you can go to Outback Steakhouse and buy a steak. Right? They're both steaks. But we know that there's a big difference between the two. Outback is better. Ah. <laughs> I think you take it as a personal slight uh, that their advertising is not, not authentic enough or what? <laughs> we don't have Outback Steakhouse in Australia, by the way. Also, in case you're interested, the Bloomin' Onion, we also don't have that in Australia. So <laughs> it's, somehow, it's somehow become ours, but yeah, we don't own that one. But we know there's a difference between you know, a high-end steak and an a Outback Steakhouse steak, or a Sizzler steak, let's say. Um, and the difference is taking care of all the details, right? So the high-end um, steak place, they get the best cut of beef. They're really careful about how they prepare it. They probably never freeze it, but if they do freeze it, then they, they have, they'd they defrost it in a special way. They always preheat the grill. They season it just right. Um, and if any one of those steps get messed up, for example, you can have the best, highest quality Wagyu beef from wherever, but if you leave it on the grill for one minute too long, you're going to get sent back, right? So there's a reason that people can make a really, really good steak, and it's about taking care of every single detail along the way. So that's what we do. And the way that we did this is I was lucky. I have a CEO who's very biologically minded and allowed me when I joined the organization to run a bunch of experiments. Right? I thought I knew a ton about DBMs having tested them all, but I really didn't know anything about how to make a DBM. So I took the scientist approach, which is go in at every step along the way. We can stop production. We can take samples out and say, OK, what happens if we demineralize more? What about less? Then we set up a high throughput screening model in these rats so that every time we have a question, we send them out, we implant them in rats, and 28 days later, we have an answer. Usually that means more questions, more iterating. Uh, and we did this for about um, 12 or 18 months, just answering a bunch of questions and becoming you know, uh, more expert in, in this field. So that's my short answer is every single step along the way from where the donor comes, the geometry I showed you, uh, a few pieces of information today about how fibers can work better than particles. So we know that there's a geometry effect, but different fiber geometries also have an effect as well. Um, how wet it is, how we sterilize it, when we sterilize it, how much carrier we put into it, how it's stored on the shelf. All of these things can take a DBM um, and turn it from its inherent potential. So you think of every donor who provides their tissue to us 
uh, for us to use to turn into a product, it has a certain level of potential. And if, say, infuses, say, a 10 out of 10, a DBM might be able to get to a 9 out of 10, let's say. But if I mess up um, any one of those steps along the way, I could take that 9 out of 10 product and turn it into an 8 out of 10, a, a 4 out of 10, and I can turn it into a 0 out of 10. Um, so without taking care of every single detail along the way, you can have the difference between a really good DBM and a, a non-effective DBM. Yeah. Questions? Great talk, Frank. Um, so that you showed a slide with uh, um, a bunch of papers from OHSU. Was that from Brian Johnstone and, and Jung Yu? Yeah. So I, I was actually in their lab at Case Western. And um, I know how difficult it is to actually produce cells that, that can actually produce bone morphogenetic proteins, right? Mm -hmm. Not only do you need like the density or concentration of cells, but then you also need media to actually allow these cells to actually produce these, these proteins. Right. So when you, when you show those results, do you think it's a matter of not having a high enough quality of cells or a concentration of cells, or do you think it's the, the signaling characteristics, why these cells are not actually producing these BMPs? Yeah, it, it certainly could be. Thanks for the question. It certainly could be about um, concentration, dose of cells. Um, the way that these products are made, it's essentially taking uh, bone from a donor, um, cleaning off all the unwanted cells. Uh, so what you have left behind is kind of like autographed um, in a jar if you will. So the concentration of cells in these products should be pretty similar to the concentration of cells in any of us in our bone. Um, my feeling on why they don't work, um, unproven, but I'll, I'll speculate anyway, um, is that if you take your own cells and you implant them back into, into you, autologous cells, they'll engraft, they'll survive, um, and they'll do their job. Um, if you take somebody else's cells, even though we may claim them to be, you know, immunoprivileged um, um, or another fancy scientific term, um, I personally don't believe that they do survive. Um, so their job then, and, and you'll hear in the stem cell field now, it used to be all about these stem cells had the ability to engraft and to differentiate into multiple lineages, and now you hear people talking more about their trophic ability. So to me, that's a fancy way of saying when you put the cells in, they die, and then whatever's in them, those growth factors are released into the body. Mm. And that's a much less compelling uh, story for me personally. The cells that are preserved, where are they on the spectrum of maturity? So um, the, the question, those cells that are preserved, where are they in the spectrum of maturity? Um, everywhere. So you'll have MSCs and you'll have osteoblasts, osteoclasts, osteocytes. So you have everywhere along that range. So it's a, a heterogeneous population. That paper that I showed from City of Hope, um, their characterization showed about two thirds of the cells had um, characteristics of being uh, progenitor cells, MSCs, and one third would be more mature. But again, uh, think of it the way that, the, the easiest way I can answer your question is, the way the products are made is they take cancellous bone, grind it up, they rinse off all the non-adherent cells, which are mostly the blood cells and the hematopoietic lineage cells, and then they preserve what's left behind. So all the adherent cells on bone is what you're getting. Oh, uh, ben? Or Eric, sorry. Hey, sorry. And I apologize if this is a little bit of a tangential question, but uh, the model I have for Fusion in a poster lyle model is sort of you decorticate the bone, you place some DBM or some sort of autograft and induces bone growth, osteoinduction, where the bone kind of grows and connects through the graft to the adjoining decorticated surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, in Earth's model where you place a DBM in a, in a rat muscle pouch, that's clearly not the case. There's no surrounding bone to, to have growth induced. So it's clearly some circulating cell or, or yep. modification cells. Um, to you know, myocytes, whatever it switches them into like an osteo sort of lineage. In a poster law model with DBM, which effect do you think is more prevalent? Is it circulating cells coming in and becoming bone cells, or is it growth inducing growth from the transverse processes? Yep. So great question. You're right. In the muscle, 100% induction, um, and there are obviously no bone cells in muscle, so it is taking a, a circulating stem cell of some sort, turning it into an osteoblast that creates bone. 
In the posterior lateral fusion model, it's a combination of the two. So you have the osteoconductive effect of bone growing from the transverse processes towards each other, and then the inductive effect all throughout uh, as well. We, uh, we see a greater effect coming from induction um, in the rat model and also in the rabbit model as well. So there was a paper published by Bowden back in, uh, it was 20 years ago now, 1999, where he looked at taking a DBM material that had no osteoconductive benefit, so it was only osteoinductive, and then a DBM that was both osteoconductive and inductive, the difference between a particle and a fiber. Compared the two together, um, when there was no osteoconductive benefit, the fusion result was about 60%, 65%. When you had the osteoconductive um, benefit, it went up to above 90%. So that also tells you about two thirds of it comes from the induction, about one third comes from conduction. Frank, Frank, can you go back to the Patrick C paper by Global Spine Journal? <clears throat> so I'm conflicted uh, because I was the editor and chief in charge of that project. So uh, Providence has struggled with this. I'm one of the two surgeons in charge of osteobiologics in the entire system, together with Hyun Bei. And um, we were really uh, struggling with how to address the cell-based uh, situation uh, fact versus reality, and again, strong surge into industry ties uh, became very apparent as we looked at utilization rates. So first of all, I want to thank you for the academic quality of your talk. For an industry-sponsored talk, I thought this was really refreshing and very helpful for me. From a system standpoint, uh, we were really confronted with a, a dramatic growth in expenses, uh, and I'll use that term uh, no knowingly of its implications, uh, for products for which we did not find any great outcomes data. So this uh, is a criticizable paper, as are all, but in fact, there are several uh, investigators in there who are heavily in the bone graft media world, such as Jeff Wong, Zorica, Tim Yoon, uh, Hans-Jörg Meisel. These are all people who've heavily been invested and they were themselves contradicting some of their older papers when willing to do that. That weighs a lot to me. This is as far as I know, and I'm conflicted. I said that because of the nature of the journal, my role there. Um, I was impressed with the thoroughness uh, of the article and the willingness of the authors to go against some of their previous work. This is my question to you. As I look at patients and see the phenomenon, which should be more than a catchword of personalized medicine, what I struggle with is the ongoing difficulty of actual clinical research. For instance, ACDFs at this point in time should not be an applicable human model for bone graft maturation anymore. It's just not the right biomechanical and biological entity anymore. You need to have vast numbers to prove something or not prove something with that. But for me, the big question to industry, regardless of whether you're cell-based or um, inductor, uh, whatever uh, uh, recombinant uh, prop, uh, progenitor you are, we don't have a target-specific decision-making help in terms of what to use when and where. We know that, in general, a host-specific intervention would be very desirable. High-risk, low-risk patients. We saw several patients today where probably we can just put hardware and then a sprinkle of a little bit of bone and they will heal if it's done biomechanically properly. Mm -hmm. Yet all of us today in clinic will see a large number of clearly predictable healing impaired patients where we want to have whatever is best. So for me, the big question to you is, all basic sciences which are necessary aside, why can't we work together and get a specific patient kind of decision-centric tool for what bone graft solutions to use in what patient? We'd love to do that. Um, 
It's a, it's a great point. I get the question all the time. Can we come up with some sort of algorithm, if you will, that lets you know if uh, patients this old with this many co comorbidities, either they need infuse or they don't, or they can use a DBM, et cetera. Um, hopefully with the AI coming around, I think that'll allow us, because the, the, the big problem here is the amount of data that you're gonna need to capture, right? Like if we're gonna make this more than just um, a single company, so it covers the breadth of all different products. Well, I just showed you data that shows that a variety of different DBMs, I think I probably showed about six different products, all perform really differently. So if we're going to try to create a data set to account for that variability, it's gonna have to be huge. Um, so hopefully with, with AI and machine learning and, and these terms I don't pretend to even understand yet, maybe that'll provide the opportunity to collect the level of data that we need. What we wanna do and what we wanna invest in are studies that prove um, the value of our products where we get challenged is what's the most important question, right? Like, What's the most important question that we need to answer so that we can then plan a study to address um, that particular question? Um, we're interested in it. Um, we have a small clinical team. It reports into me at C-Spine. We want to get involved in studies. We want to show the benefit. We want to look at our studies uh, and our clinical benefit, particularly aligned with the economic value, right? So a good study I, I, I get uh, proposed commonly is, you know, can we compare ourselves to Infuse, and even if we don't need to show the exact same fusion rate as Infuse, can we show a comparable fusion rate at a lower cost? Um, that's something we'd be interested to do. Um, clearly, we'd be interested and are interested in showing that we can perform better than these cell-based products where we can have higher performance at even lower cost. Um, the challenge there is now trying to find surgeons who want to enroll patients in the cell-based product um, arms of the studies. So we're open to it. If you want to have a discussion, um, um, I'd love to do it. The, on a broad scale, I think it's going to require some sort of uh, institutional or in industry level of commitment rather than just a single company. Um, but we'd be happy to help, help try. And then if I can answer one other question that you didn't ask, um, but about uh, when you talked about uh, Jeff Wong and Zori, who were both collaborators with us on this particular study, um, potentially going back on some of the things that, that they had previously um, uh, said as well. I put myself in that same boat, right? I launched OsteoCell, I helped launch OsteoCell for Nuvasiv, was a big believer in the direction of that technology. And it really ended up being the clinical data, um, particularly that one ACDF paper um, that uh, is authored by Dr. Eastlack, that for me started to um, really lessen my enthusiasm for those products. And now I'm here trying to um, um, show a different side of that story, if you will. Which is appreciated. So first of all, maybe we can have a quick offline discussion. We have to go on rounds in a second and start our clinical day. Um, uh, the, the one uh, uh, real point I want to again make is I'm always worried when uh, human beings say AI is the answer because uh, I always think about the garbage in, garbage out uh, yeah. equation, which supersedes any AI belief. I firmly believe that uh, simplifying things and structuring the data input will lead to meaningful data output. And I don't need a computer to tell me what to do, but guidelines uh, and checklists do help and do help improve the quality of medicine. I well, believe maybe, in that. Maybe, uh, it, yeah, that's a fair point. Um, maybe just a greater level of data is really, really what we need. Yeah. Structured, well, uh, well planned, and uh, yep. uh, consequently analyzed data. Mm -hmm. But thank you for a great talk. Thank you for having me.